Let's bring in now Bradley Bowman with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Brad is a U.S. veteran, and we've spoken many times about the nexus of U.S. and European military policies vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and Russia. Brad, it's good to see you again. First, l let me ask you, we're talking about a victory plan here. Um, what does victory mean? It's a fundamental question, and thanks for the opportunity to join you. You know, victory for Ukraine I think would mean evicting Russian forces and reestablishing Kyiv's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders, including Crimea. I sound like someone at the UN, but I think that would basically be it. Of course, that's easier said than done. And I see no easy or quick path to get from where we are now to such an outcome. But that's what victory would look like. And some people in Washington and maybe in Europe say, well, that sounds hard or impossible. So therefore, we should maybe stop trying. But the problem is that that path is quite clear. If the U.S. and Europe deprive Ukraine of the means of self-defense, I think there's a rather clear path to a Russian victory. So just because something is long and difficult and not clear doesn't mean you stop trying. And I think that's something that uh, uh, decision makers need to keep in mind. And the big idea here, at least in terms of Zelensky, is trying to increase the cost for Putin to shift his cost-benefit analysis. The, the U.S. under Joe Biden has provided Ukraine with the backing that it's needed to, to survive. But some would say this incrementalist way that the weapons have come has never given Ukraine the tools that it needs to win. Do you see it that way as well? You know, I see truth on both sides. I, I see some credit here for the Biden administration and some blame. Uh, the credit is, you know, uh, the Biden administration warned Europe before the February 24th, 2022 invasion that this was coming. Uh, when deterrence failed and the invasion, uh, invasion came, they assembled an extraordinary international coalition to help Ukraine and implemented what I would call the most impressive U.S. security assistance campaign in, in recent American history. But I would also agree with much of your premise that when big decisions came, what, you know, whether you provide tanks, whether you provide long-range munitions, whether you support the provision of F-16s, We've seen what I've been calling this no, maybe, yes dynamic. The first answer is no, then it's maybe, and then it's finally yes. And that plays out over weeks or months. And what's happening during those weeks or months? Ukrainians are dying defending their homes, and the Russians are advancing. So these delayed decisions or non-decisions have cost too. Ukraine showed back in 2023 with its failed offensive that it wasn't able to break through Russian lines where the defenses are strong. Is that a realistic expectation of Ukraine's capabilities, even if they're given all of the weapons that they want? You know, there's nothing harder in warfare, generally speaking, than frontal assaults on fixed positions when those forces are dug in and they have artillery support and, and this modern warfare where basically if you're seen and you will be seen, you can be killed. So most of the instances where we've seen significant laudable Ukrainian advances are when it is against forces that have not been dug in, it, whether it be in the early uh, months or what we've seen recently uh, from the incursion into Russia. So um, I think any plan that relies on large scale uh, penetration, exploitation of fixed Russian lines, I would want to see the details behind that because I don't think we see a lot of evidence that that's forthcoming anytime soon. What about Ukraine saying that it, it wants permission to use um, U.S. long range missiles deep inside Russia. What's the utility of that, in your opinion? You know, yeah, no, the utility of long-range weapons uh, is that it enables Ukrainians to, to target ammo depots, command and control nodes, transportation hubs, airfields, runways, uh, and their offensive strike capabilities. Uh, and by doing that, you force the Russians to take a number of uh, steps that helps Kyiv. They pull those forces back. And so when they're launching those strikes from further back, it gives Ukrainians more time to respond and defend themselves. And it also forces the Russians to disperse their forces, uh, whether it be their, their ammo depots, their logistics nodes, or their actual combat forces. And that makes command and control more difficult uh, and, and creates time-consuming inefficiencies. So there's all kinds of reasons why, from a Ukrainian perspective, why you'd want these increased permission of Washington to use American weapons deep inside Russia as opposed to what we've seen just across the border. Donald Trump says that he will end the war on day one of his presidency if he is reelected. 
The peace plan pushed by J.D. Vance basically freezes the conflict, leaving Russia with everything. Do, do you see a solution for the future which will not look a lot like that? I, I hear what former President Trump is saying. I've seen what uh, 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 J.D. Vance has said, and um, that sounds like a, a victory for Putin. Anything that locks in some version of the status quo is an absolute victory for the Kremlin because they will have seized territory with military force, and that would be the United States accepting it. That would be a disaster for international law, for the rule of law, and would send a horrible message to the Middle East and the Pacific that if you just wait the Americans out, sooner or later they'll give in and you can get, uh, uh, accomplish your political objectives with military force. I think that would be an unambiguous disaster for Europe and the United States and international security. Let me ask you before we run out of time, the, you know, the future, the fate of this war, um, how much of it depends on the outcome of Election Day in November in the United States? You know, there's a term in American politics. I used to teach American politics at West Point, among other things, is that elections matter. You hear that in Washington a lot. I think a U.S. policy toward Ukraine and Europe and Russia, uh, there's very two, there's two di very different uh, uh, policies on offer here. I, I, when you look in some regions, you think, hey, one administration might be a little stronger. You look in Europe, I, I think a Harris administration has a fundamentally different policy toward Russia, Ukraine, and NATO than Trump administration does. I think if passes prologue, that's indisputable. All right, Bradley Bowman with the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Brad, as always, we appreciate your time and your analysis. Thank you.